So Bart, next up is Bart Raperta from – he's in the CCA right now, I believe. Uh, fresh uh, – he's been there for a year. Is that true? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So he'll be talking about uh, resistive MHD, um, resistive GRMHD, and his simulations that uh, he's been working on. All right, yeah, I'll be talking a bit more about magnetic reconnection and, and hotspot formation in black hole accretion flows. And uh, first of all, I want to thank Ferial for her excellent talk. And uh, because of her uh, great introduction into, into um, the phenomena that we're looking at, I can probably uh, quickly go through my, uh, my initial slides. Um, we've all seen this image uh, by, by the EHT. And um, I, want to, I want to tell you a little bit of, of what we're typically doing and how we can improve. Um, so the EHT captures the, the accreting plasma and it's under influence of strong gravitational electromagnetic fields. So that's why we do general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations to, to see if we can reproduce the observations. As Pariol already mentioned, for I think for Sagittarius A star, but, but the numbers for M87 are, are uh, similar, the macroscopic scale of, of the shadow is about, is of about 10 to the 8 kilometers but the microscopic scale, say the gyration scale of an electron, is about one kilometer. So there are eight um, orders of magnitude difference. And it means that the mean free path of the particle is much larger um, than the system size. And that, again, means that our plasma is collisionless and that non-thermal effects are important. Ferial already mentioned all of that. Um, MHD treats the plasma as a fluid, which is by definition not collisionless, so we don't know what the electrons are doing, and that gives us the main uncertainty in interpreting the radiation from the, from the EHT. There's another example that, that Ferio also already mentioned. Those are the, the flares observed by, uh, from Sagittarius A star in the last uh, 20 years or so, and, and recently um, even the orbit of a, of a hotspot by, by, by the gravity interferometer. Um, and also here, um, non-ideal effects like magnetic reconnection are conjectured to, uh, to produce these, these hotspots. Um, electrons have to accelerate to Lorentz factors of, say, 10 to the 6 to explain the observed uh, infrared and X-ray emission, um, after which they emit the non-thermal radiation. Uh, but, but also here in this system, we know that the electron gyro radius is about 10 to the minus 11 Schwarzschild radii, and the emission region of this hotspot is about 1 Schwarzschild radii. So again, here we have an extreme scale separation where we would uh, ideally use kinetic theory to describe the microphysics, but magnetohydrodynamics to describe the global dynamics of the accretion disk and the jet. So how do we do that? Um, we usually describe a relativistic plasma with a magnetization parameter that's larger than one, meaning that the magnetic enthalpy density is larger than the thermal enthalpy density. And that can uh, result into relativistic velocities, so the Lorentz factor is larger than one. And we are usually working in curved space-time, so we have a non-zero uh, Riemann tensor. However, this curved space-time is usually taken as a background, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's static. So if we solve the MHD equations in this background, then we have the uh, conservation laws or the inviscid Navier-Stokes equations. We don't really know how to include the viscosity, although that, that, would be, that would be great if we were able to do that. And then additionally, we solve Maxwell's equations um, uh, for the evolution of the electromagnetic field, and together that's the GRMHD system. In ideal uh, GRMHD, we assume that, uh, that there is an infinite conductivity meaning that the resistivity uh, goes to zero, which is generally a very good approximation for accretion disks. According to Alfin's theorem, this means that the fields are frozen into the fluid, and it means that the electric field vanishes in the fluid frame. You can write this down in the 3 plus 1 split, uh, and you will see that uh, there are no parallel electric fields, so E dot B is zero, and the total electric energy density has to be smaller than the magnetic energy density uh, to keep a drift speed that's... Um, that's smaller than the speed of light. As I said, this means that no parallel electric field can form, and we can just simply say that E is minus V cross B. And if we plug that into the equations, we just need to solve the induction equation on top of Euler's equations. So this all simplifies our set of equations, but it also means that, in theory, magnetic field cannot break and reconnect. It can, of course, due to numerical resistivity in our simulations, 
um, but, but in theory it should not. It also means that the parallel electric field that is responsible for at least the initial kick of particle acceleration cannot, uh, cannot form. So we are trying to go one step further and solve the resistive GRMHD equations. Um, it, it, it still means that the macroscopic aspects are covered by, by the MHD flow, but we try to uh, mimic the collisionless aspects or the microscopic aspects for which you actually need kinetic physics, which is too demanding. We try to capture that into a resistivity, which can be scalar or tensorial. In this case, it's scalar. Um, and that resistivity allows uh, for reconnection to occur. Such a resistivity is typically very small in astrophysical plasmas, which means that you need to resolve very small uh, length scales. And for that, we use adaptive mesh refinement. I will show a little bit uh, more about that later. Um, theoretically, in, the ter in terms of equations, we need to solve an additional uh, equation, and that's Ampere's law, which is absent in, um, in uh, Newtonian resistive MHD, but because we are solving a relativistic system, we need to um, take into account uh, uh, temporal derivatives of the electric field. And if you uh, plug in a resistive Ohm's law into this set of equations, you see that the current density goes at one over the resistivity, and this is the source term for the electric field evolution. Uh, so this introduces not only a, a small length scales, but also very short time scales. So this source term is stiff, which makes it very hard to solve numerically, and for that we use an implicit explicit method. Um, I won't go into details further, but you can read it in my, uh, in my paper. Um, in this case, in this way, parallel electric fields can naturally form and they can accelerate uh, particles or test particles that are, uh, that are, that are absent in ideal MHD. Um, now the phenomenon that we try to describe with this set of equations, relativistic magnetic reconnection, I will, I will give a, a quick overview, but Ferry already um, uh, told most of the important things. Um, well, the vesic, magnetic reconnection happens if we have anti-parallel field lines. There is a magnetic null in the middle uh, and there is a current sheet. The current or the magnetic energy density can dissipate through the resistivity, which is either numerical in ideal MHD or explicit in resistive MHD. And if we have a highly magnetized plasma, uh, so if, if sigma is, is large, then there is a lot of magnetic energy density that can dissipate uh, into kinetic or thermal energy. This whole process has a multi-scale character and the inflow into the current sheet is usually well described by force-free or ideal MHD at, at a high magnetization. There is a resistive zone around the, 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 the X point that you see here and the X point itself really can only properly be described by kinetic theory or by pick simulation, so to say. Um, if we, if we do such a simulation in a, in a, in a particle and cell uh, code, as Fariol has already shown, and as I'm showing here um, uh, by a slide that I stole from Greg Werner, who, who I think is in the audience, um, so thank him for that, uh, we see that, uh, that a current sheet um, can tear up and tiny plasmoids can form, uh, which can then advect with the flow. Uh, those plasmoids can, can, uh, can, can merge and then grow into larger um, plasmoids or hotspots, they're usually uh, hot, they have a high temperature, and they contain accelerated particles. Um, reconnection can happen again between those merging plasmoids, which uh, takes care of, 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 of a new batch of smaller plasmoids. So this is an ongoing process that goes down in, in scale. Now the question is, can we model this process in resistive uh, magnetohydrodynamics? And then uh, even better, can we model it around uh, a black hole to see where current sheets form and how they form and what the plasmoid statistics are and if we can link them to flares. Um, if we look at this Wikipedia image, we see the, we see the typical reconnection process. And here you see a little uh, cartoon of, of how plasmoids would look like in such a sheet. Um, and to mimic this, we need a small uh, resistivity. So if we plug that in uh, and we make it small enough such that our Lundquist number is, is, is high enough to, to form plasmoids, it looks something like this. This is a local box uh, resistive MHD simulation of the same process as I showed before in PIC. And also here we see that small plasmoids form, that they advect with the flow, merge, and, 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 and grow into larger uh, potentially observable structures. Um, and the question is, the current sheets that form in global simulations, do they have a length scale such that this can all uh, actually happen? 
So if we run global uh, axisymmetric uh, simulations with a, with a resistivity here, we have to be careful what this resistivity actually is because it introduces a length scale. Um, if we have a very small resistivity that's actually under-resolved on the grid, uh, like 10 to the minus 14 here on the right, we retrieve the ideal MHD results uh, of, of, of accretion flow simulations. We see that the MRI, the magnetorotational instability, um, uh, kicks in in the disk and it develops turbulence and uh, it launches a, a blanford zayek uh, jet. If we have a too high resistivity, like 10 to the minus 2 here on the left, we see that the MRI is quenched by, the, by, by diffusion and no turbulence can develop and there is no strong jet that, uh, that, uh, that is launched. So a small resistivity retrieves the global ideal GRMHD result, which is, a, which is a good thing. However, it's important that this resistivity is actually resolved on the grid. Uh, otherwise, you might as well just be doing ideal GRMHD simulations and there is no need for any um, complicated numerical algorithms. So can we, uh, can we do, to, to do that, to see if we can do that, we, we test it first in a turbulent flow, in a typical turbulent flow, to see what, what, what kind of resolutions we need to capture uh, the resistive effects. And here you see a video of, of a simple Orzak tongue vortex, which is a standard test for MHD codes. Um, and you're looking at the rest mass density. And this is for a resistivity that is so small that we are in the plasmoid regime. So the Lunkus number is above 10 to the four. And we see that plasmoids form here, and you see it as well in the current density here in the thin current sheets uh, diagonally. You see, uh, you see, you see plasmoids. If we do a resolution study, we see that we need resolutions of 10,000 squared or higher to resolve the plasmoid formation and to not underestimate the magnetic energy density evolution here. You see in the in the in the purple and in the cyan lines that the magnetic energy density is is actually um, underestimated in this case. How can we reach such resolutions uh, on a global scale? Well, here, adaptive mesh refinement comes, uh, comes to help. And you see, I don't know if it's visible, but you see um, the little uh, squares here, they're uh, eight by eight cells. So, so the current sheet here is captured by, by, by more than 20 cells over its width. So it's, it's well resolved. But in the background here around the current sheet, you see larger uh, little squares, um, meaning that the, resol the local resolution there is um, is, is, is smaller uh, such that the simulation remains uh, doable. So now back to global uh, accretion simulations, again in, in uh, axisymmetry. Um, we initialize a small resistivity of 5 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, this gives uh, uh, a plasma in a plasmoid dominated regime with a Lunkus number of 10 to the 5 approximately. Uh, we use six levels of mesh refinement, uh, giving us an effective resolution of about 12,000 by 6,000. And it means that the current sheets that we see are captured by more than 10 cells over their widths, uh, such that the plasmoid formation process is, is converged. Now, if we zoom in, we see that almost the whole disk is covered by the highest two levels of mesh refinement, so the resolution is where it should be. And we see indeed that uh, close to the black hole in the inner 10 Schwarzschild radii, we, uh, we, we get current sheets that become plasmoid unstable, and we see that they're well resolved. As you can see here, we see even mergers of plasmoids and secondary current sheets uh, forming here that are actually not fully resolved. So how does this look like in a video? In a, in a sane simulation, we see that this process, once the simulation has reached a quasi-study state, is, is ongoing and, and happens um, all the time, practically. So a new current sheet, form, uh, current sheet forms uh, form all the time, and plasmoids are either falling into the black hole or they are uh, escaping and they, they orbit in the disk or they move along the jet um, in the up or down direction. Uh, you see here in the, in, the, in the temperature plot, the middle plot, that, that in current sheets, the temperature uh, is, is higher as we would expect. And in the plasma beta parameter or the inverse plasma beta parameter, you see current, that current sheets are indicated by um, by, 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 by a magnetic field that goes to zero. So, so, so far, uh, so good. If we zoom into this current sheet, we see indeed that, um, that it's covered by, by, uh, by, by more than 10, 10 cells over its width. Uh, the blocks here that I'm drawing have uh, 64 by 64, uh, two, uh, 32 by 64 cells. Uh, so we can, uh, we can with confidence say that the thinning process is, is converged. And we actually see if we plot the magnetic, um, magnetic field through the sheet, we see that we, we have Harris-type sheets, as, as Ferry already explained. 
and it means that uh, local local recognition analysis is actually completely valid, as, as David Ball, for example, did already a few years ago. Um, we also find a recognition rate of 0, 0.01 times the speed of light, which confirms uh, MHD theory of, of uh, fast recognition. Now, can we link this to observations? Um, we see that plasmoids form in this sheet and that they that they can escape the black hole and, and, and merge into um, what I call a monster plasmoid here, uh, which is actually uh, larger than the, than the event horizon scale. Um, these monster plasmoids, um, they, they can escape uh, or they can, they, they're sort of expelled into the disk. And the question is, would they, in, in, in a full 3D simulation, would they orbit and would they give a signal that looks like the, the gravity uh, um, collaboration observations? And would it result into a flare? But we cannot, in axisymmetry, we cannot uh, look at orbiting plasmoids, but we can look uh, into flare properties. Um, we have seen that plasmoids form within the inner 10 RG, which is good. The lifetime of those plasmoids is typically about 100 RG over, over C, which in Sagittarius A star units is uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and the maximum size of the plasmoids that we see, or the, the hotspots, so, so, so merged plasmoids, is a one to two Schwarzschild radii. Uh, and again, this confirms uh, the reconnection rate because they form within 100 RG over C. Those plasmoids in, this, in the same simulation, so the, the standard and normal evolution simulation that I showed you, have relativistic temperatures that are larger than one, uh, and they're heated by relativistic reconnection. However, the temperatures are not much, much larger than one. So maybe we need more magnetic energy to power the plasmoids. And we know that in magnetically arrested disks, the magnetic energy density typically piles up and, and becomes much larger. So, so we ran a math simulation, also an axisymmetry, and here we see that an equatorial current sheet forms, um, there are actually multiple, and it also becomes plasmoid unstable. Um, and now you will see that the temperature will significantly increase once plasmoids um, merge and can escape. And we see that, um, that, they, uh, that they move along the jet and they, they heat the jet uh, sheet. So, so the boundary between the jet and the disk, for example, here. Um, and this is an ongoing process. However, it happens more periodically uh, than in the same simulation where it happened all the time. So we can again look uh, look a little bit closer and, and because of the, the higher magnetization, we reach higher temperatures, the time scale of the plasmoid formation is similar. So what you see here is an infalling flux tube or, or, or a current sheet, it becomes plasmoid unstable, as you can see in the second plot, and these, these little blobs form. The blobs merge and move outwards into like a monster plasmoid, and the, the, the monster plasmoid gets ejected along the jet here. If we plot the temperature now, we see that, uh, that, the, that the equatorial current sheet is very warm, but also that the whole jet a sheath region is, is very hot, and that this all happens within the inner 10 RG. It depends a little bit on which uh, spin you have. Um, and if we then calculate the temperature in Sagittarius A star uh, units, we see that, um, that it's about 10 to the five times higher uh, in, in, in a flare period, and a flare period is indicated by, by such a hot region uh, uh, at the jet boundary, uh, than in quiescence, and a quiescence is indicated by the black line. Um, if we look at the magnetic field, we see sort of the opposite. So the black line in, in quiescence is, is higher than during the flare, um, which, is, which, is, uh, which is here indicated by the drop in the magnetic energy density. And if you look at uh, earlier papers by Ponti and by, by, by uh, Dots Eden, you see that this is exactly what is expected uh, observationally uh, from a flare. So the temperature has to raise several orders of magnitude and the magnetic field has to go, has to, has to drop during a flare. So if we, um, if we set the magnetic field, uh, if we normalize the magnetic field such that it's between 50 and 10 uh, Gauss during quiescence, so we, that's the black line again, um, then we see that during a flare it drops to uh, between say one and five uh, Gauss, which is, which is again in accordance with observations. I have to mention this happens only in mad disks because in, in, a, in, a, in the same simulation, you're practically in between the black and the and the blue and the red lines all the time. So there is no clear distinction between a flare and between the quiescence. In the mad simulations, um, the flare lasts about 30 to 60 minutes, 
but probably due to the axisymmetry, the period in between flares is too short. It's also about an hour to two hours in Sagittarius A star time instead of 12 to 24 hours. Now, the, the, the main question that everyone will have, and, and, and Ferriol also got a question about that already, is can we see the same process in 3D? Um, 3D simulations would, would, would tell us about the azimuthal motion of the hotspots, but also about the interaction of the hotspots with non-axisymmetric instabilities like Kelvin Helmholtz or Rayleigh Taylor. Uh, and it would give us more information about the time scales uh, of, of the flares and whether we can match them with observations. The first question to answer is, do plasmoid unstable current sheets actually still form? And for that, we ran um, a hammer simulation but we needed resolutions that are 10 times 10 times 10, so 1,000 times larger than the standard EHT simulations. Um, this was possible with the GPU acceleration of Hammer, and if we ran a 1,024 cube simulation, then we saw that this thin current sheet here formed, uh, which is again indicated by, uh, by high plasma beta, and it formed within the inner three Schwarzschild radii, and it, it, it remained stable for quite a long time, and if you look carefully, you even see hints of plasmoids. So here they're under-resolved, first of all, because this is an ideal MHD simulation, and second of all, because we know from 2D simulations that we need resolutions that are about uh, 6,000 cubed. So we're currently uh, ramping up the, um, the, the, the resolution, which is, of course, very expensive, but we're hoping to be able to do simulations of, of 2,000 cubed or maybe even 4,000 cubed in the nearby future such that we can answer the question whether plasmoids form in 3D, what kind of structure they have, how they will, how they will move azimuthally, and, and, um, and if we can link their uh, statistics to flare properties that are uh, observed. Now, um, to, to put this on, on a little bit more firm footing, we have future ideas um, uh, on, on, on what to do. We can evolve test particles in our code, uh, so, so they, they accelerate due to the electromagnetic field that comes from resistive MHD, but they don't have a feedback like in, in, in particle and cell. We can use them to study acceleration processes and to obtain electron distribution functions that can be fed to the, to the, to the ray tracing. Um, and our first indications are that, that the resistive MHD simulation of, of decaying turbulence gives very similar resolution, uh, uh, solutions to, uh, to PIC simulations, where you see a combination of reconnection that gives an initial kick in an X point uh, to the particles that kicks them out of the Maxwellian distribution and turbulence that takes over and accelerates the particles further through a Fermi type acceleration. Um, so all of this can, can be studied in global 3D resistive GRMHD simulations with test particles. And we can see if all of this is altered by the global dynamics and also what kind of effect it has on the global dynamics and on the radiation that we, that we observe with gravity and with the EHT. Um, this was everything that I had to tell. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Bart. Um, so I guess just a clarification on the, the stuff with MAD. So that the period, the time scale for the flares is exactly the period for like the f typical flux dissipation events uh, where you just see the, 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 the disc bounce around in, well, in 3D at least. So the 3D, if you just look, just naively take the 3D mads that are already existing, the time scale there for the, the dissipation events, that matches what you would expect for the flare, right? Is that true? Um, you said the time scales were too short, or the period was too short in 2D. So in 2D, the, the, the period of the flare seems to be matching, but the period in between flares right, um, that's seems to be yeah. too short. Uh, I discussed this a little bit with Jason, and, and, and we, we thought about this, um, but, but it's kind of hard to say in the 3D math simulations that are sort of on the market at the moment, because uh, they rely, first of all, on numerical resistivity, and because the resolution is not yet as high as, as, as we would need to resolve the whole process. This, this numerical resistivity can alter the time scale of the plasmoid formation or can even completely um, prohibit it because, of, because it's too high and it, it sort of diffuses everything out. So, so I, we will only know once we do sort of resolve 3D um, simulations. 
Um, we have a question on the chat. Does your simulation take into account the thickness of the accretion disk or is it independent of it? Um, uh, I, I don't fully understand the question. I mean, I, I take it into account for what exactly? Uh, I guess that's the problem with the, the chat. <laughs> Let me ask a related question then. Does this apply this all applies to thick disks. It would be a different yeah. regime entirely. If we yeah, right. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, so you made nice arguments about needing high resolution and resolving this small resistivity, but I guess, sorry if I just missed it or I'm just not understanding, but what sets the value of the resistivity? This is a choice that you make. Um, we're nowhere near the scales of particles, so I guess what sets this choice and is is there a physically motivated choice to make or is this basically just trying to separate in some way the scales of the microphysics from the scales of the accretion form? So I think um, what I'm what I'm what I was trying to say is that uh, regardless of whether you do ideal or resistive MHD, so regardless whether you have explicit or numerical resistivity, that resistivity has to be small enough to be in a regime where your magnetic Reynolds number or Lundquist number is higher than 10 to the 4. We know theoretically by, by for example, papers by Dimitrius Densky and Amitava Batakarchi that um, that this this, uh, this value has to be 10 to the 4 or higher. And um, you can link that to a length scale and a resistivity. So, so let's say length scale over resistivity should be larger than 10 to the 4. If that is set by a very high resolution in ideal MHD, it's fine. If that's set by an explicit resolve resistivity in resistive GRMHD, it's also fine. And once we reach that scale, um, so say 10 to the 4, or I think we can maximally do at the moment 10 to the 5, um, because at that point we just, like we need simulations that are 100,000 100, uh, squared or 100,000 cubed, so they're just impossible. Um, once we reach that scale, then we are in the regime where uh, where the reconnection becomes independent of the resistivity. So your your reconnection becomes fast and plasmoid dominated. Uh, so at that point, the value doesn't matter anymore. So the, so the simple answer is, as long as your resistivity is below a, cer a certain threshold, then we will capture plasmoid formation. Whether the physics will be significantly different if you were to go to really really low resistivities that are really realistic is a question that we, we, I think we cannot answer with simulations. Thanks a lot, that's a really helpful answer. So Bupendra has a question which you addressed a little bit, but I guess he, uh, there, you could have to, you could elaborate on it a little bit. Um, we'll be focused in three <laughs> We can tell you're in New York. Yeah, sorry for the, sorry for the noise. It's, it's unavoidable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I guess just the, the question is how much how much can you say about the 3D simulations that you haven't already said in terms of extending the 2D results to 3D? Or did you say all that you can really say? Well, so, so these are really new results that, that, um, that we analyzed last week with Kaushik Chatterjee and, and Matthew Liska. Um, one thing I can say is that we, we definitely need a higher resolution still um, because you see like these things that I highlighted here might or might not be plasmoids, but even if they are, they're not, they're not really resolved. Um, but the indications are good so far that uh, the, the currency that we, that we get becomes very thin and much thinner than in low resolution simulations, um, which makes the result look a lot like the axisymmetric result. Uh, but we need to run this longer, we need to go through a, a few accretion periods, and we need to run higher resolution to be really certain of of what we're seeing. So we have about four minutes left until break. Um, so that was, we went, went a little late, so there was time for discussion when, uh, in addition to the questions. So I think we'll just push that to after the two talks this afternoon, just kind of combine the discussion depending on what we want to discuss, and I guess we can just break for coffee now, unless anybody has Who's any further. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, I, 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 I had my hand up, but probably hard to see. So, um, yeah, we get the great talk, Bart. Uh, it's beautiful to see the tearing of 
of current sheets and global simulations. It's really getting there, beautiful. So um, two quick questions. One is you said the reconnection speeds are typically like 1% of the speed of light. What are your typical sigmas there? Um, I think I had a plot uh, of sigma. Uh, so if you look here um, in, in the second plot, uh, you see that the current sheets that form uh, sort of at the jet boundary or in the mat case really equatorially, then the sigma is, is practically the floor sigma, so it goes to 100. Um, the current sheets that form in the disk have a sigma of about one. Um, I see that the plasmoids that get really hot and that can actually sort of uh, limb brighten the jet, they form in the regions where sigma is significantly larger than one. And the plasmoids that are in the disk or that, that form in the disk, um, they don't heat up as much. Uh, they, they form, they, they exist, but they're not as hot. Okay, I was trying to compare it to the alpine velocity there, the reconnection speed to it, it should be the speed of flight practically. Where, where you see hotspots, the alphane velocity is practically the speed of flight. Sigma is, is, is significantly higher than 10, so it's, it's really uh, C. Okay, very good. Um, my other question was, um, at some point you showed a monster plasmoid forming and you said it gets ejected along the, um, along the jet. What velocities do, does that happen at? The reason I'm asking is um, we basically, in, in our model that explains the um, gravity flares, we rely on these monster plasmoids that are moving along the jets, but we just guess the velocity that resembles the, the, um, or the trajectory. So what, what do you see? I think um, I had this question before, and, and, and uh, people are often interested whether the velocity is capillarian or, or, or not. Um, I think those plasmoids sort of, they become um, sort of disconnected from the disk, so they can have any type of velocity that reconnection gives them. And we typically see that they're uh, mildly uh, relativistic. So they, they're not very, very fast, but they're, they're yeah, trans-relativistic, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't make a big point out of this because I, I think in, in 3D this might be very different and also the velocity I'm talking about here is really along the jet and not in, in, in the third direction let's say and, and we are more interested actually in how they move in the, in the third direction for the gravity observations. Um, yeah but it doesn't have to be a Keplerian orbit in fact, right. in fact it, it could have some high velocity but it could really just be um, moving along the jet direction too and right. lensing it gives you some of that circular motion anyway. Okay, great, thank you. And then Nicholas has a question, probably the last one before we break. Thank you very much. Um, so as you emphasize, 3D simulation of that would be like really expensive. Well, is there any hope or like, would you do uh, gain information from that to educate like ideal or resolution image simulation, like have a statistics of, I don't know, like current sheet distribution size or like a distribution of the current sheet size as a function of parameters inside the disk. So of course, like for Sagittarius A-star, we need to resolve the temporal evolution that wouldn't be helpful. But if you're more interested in like an average level of non-thermal radiation, would you be able to do that? Um, I have three answers to this. One is uh, in local box simulations of, of, of turbulence or Harris sheets, we can do resolved or nearly resolved 3D simulations. Um, so there we can probe whether we're doing the right thing in MHD, whether that is resistive or ideal compared to particle and cell. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is that um, with, with the, this GPU accelerated hammer code, we can do um, significantly higher than 1,000 cubed. So we, we hope to be able to go to resolutions that can resolve um, the thin current sheet in the, in, the, in the very nearby future. And the third thing is that if you look at uh, Jason's, Jason Dexter's paper and also Oliver Port's paper of, uh, of 3D math simulations, you see uh, you see that like an equatorial current sheet forms, uh, and Jason has, has nice pictures of this um, in, in, his, in his paper, 
um, but that currency did not thin enough yet to see plasmoids, and that is because it's it's only captured by one or two cells at that point. So globally, I would say in in lower resolution uh, simulations, uh, global math simulations, you already see hints, and you can, for example, and and that's something that David Ball already did years ago. You can uh, monitor um, uh, current sheets by looking at the curl of the magnetic field, and you see that they that they form and that they're there, and you can relate that to uh, to non-thermal um, uh, radiation. Uh, we we just try to put that on on more firm footing by by seeing if whether this whole process of plasmoid formation actually happens, and and to see that process, um, we we need uh, like like 2,000 4,000 cube simulations. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Sorry about this. Yeah, just to make sure that the question is that, for example, in a simulation where you see a thin current sheet, but that is due to numerical res resistivity, and you are not very far from seeing a plasmoid, but just you don't go to high enough re resolution, would you be able to put like a subgrid model kind of that says that? For this kind of properties, you expect that many current sheet with that a plasmoid with that size, or you expect a monster plasmoid to form every now and then, and like have some kind of. Um, first part of your question, the answer is yes. That, that, uh, that, that's as Asfariel uh, sh showed. I think um, this has been done uh, by, by several groups, by Jason, by by Fariel's group, um, and and you can, you you can do this. You can sort of. Assume that uh, that that, it, that it, a thinner current sheet would form and would form plasmoids, and that all of this produces non-thermal radiation. And because we also have pick simulations of the same process that are fully resolving the, the physics, we sort of know that that what we expect is is is, is very likely at least. Um, whether to say if you see a monster plasmoid forming, if you were to thin further, I mean that that you can really not know. For that, you really need to do the simulation, I think. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to break and then hold that question until later on in the discussion uh, in the afternoon slash morning, depending on what your time zone is.